The new millennium is fast approaching. Your adult life is just beginning. But for reasons unknown to this day, you vanish one dark December night. This is the disappearance of Michael Negrete. Let's step into the cold. Michael Negrete was just 18 years old when he vanished in the early hours of the 10th of December, 1999. The new millennium may still be in its infancy, but Michael's family has spent the first 17 years of the 21st century waiting for any news on their missing loved one. Michael William Negrete came into the world on the 25th of March 1981 in Los Angeles, California, the first child of Miguel and Mary Negrete. Later, Michael would become a big brother to two younger brothers. The family lived in Sabre Springs and Michael spent his high school years at the high school in Rancho Bernando. When deciding where he would spend his university years, he chose to stay in his native Southern California. Enrolling at the University of California campus in Los Angeles was a no-brainer. He was far enough away from home to be independent, but close enough to know that his family was not too far away if he needed them. By the time he turned 18, Michael was 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighed 130 pounds. His name was shortened to Mike most of the time, his brown hair was styled into a crew cut and his eyes were brown. He was in good shape with well developed neck and bicep muscles, but it was his smile that would draw you to his appearance. It was one of the happiest smiles you would ever come across. Michael did not have a personality that could be easily ignored. His loud laugh would easily catch your attention. You would know that he's happy with something when he says dupe. Walk around with no socks and shoes on and you'd soon discover that he finds bare feet repulsive. His love of music would come as no surprise. You'd find him singing jazz songs to himself. Then there's the fact that he was an accomplished trumpet and steel drum player. Ask him any question about the Simpsons and he'd give you a correct answer. Like many people, he enjoyed spending time playing computer games. It was computer games that would later play a role in his disappearance. The 10th of December 1999 was a Friday. Many students at UCLA would have been looking forward to a weekend of partying after a hard week of studying. Michael was no different. He was a good student and knew that his music scholarship relied on getting the best grades. His dorm room was located on the sixth floor of Dykstra Hall, a dormitory of the UCLA campus that is located near the intersection of Gailey Avenue and Strathmore Boulevard. Michael, dressed in a blue plaid shirt, khaki shorts and white shoes, had spent time that night with friends at a party held on his dorm room's floor. Margaritas were drunk and music blared. Michael eventually returned to his dorm room. A computer game was calling. An intranet connection meant that Michael could compete with a friend who was located in another dorm room while playing the game. The pair spent hours playing against each other before Michael accepted defeat at 4am. He headed to the other student's room to congratulate him on his victory, even giving him a high five. A security camera recorded the freshman leaving his residence hall by himself. This was the last time that anyone saw or heard from Michael. His roommate awoke the next morning at 9am to find that Michael had vanished. When Michael left his dorm room for the last time, he did not take any of his belongings with him. His clothes, shoes, wallet and his cherished musical instruments were all found in his room. The possibility of Michael getting into his vehicle and driving off into the night was ruled out. He had no car at UCLA. The police conducted a search of Dykstra Hall's garbage and every construction site on campus. No trace of Michael was found. Search dogs became a part of the investigation and they were able to track Michael's scent to Sunset Boulevard and Bellagio Street. 
Michael's scent was also tracked to a bus stop, but whether this bus stop was on Sunset Boulevard or Bellagio Street is unclear. No other evidence was found and there has been no activity on Michael's bank account, credit cards or Ralph's club card since he vanished. Detectives Bill Howell and Joe Purcell have both worked on the case and by 2003 they had received 500 tips. Sadly, nothing important ever came from the information given. Most students living in Dykstra Hall saw nothing strange that night, but in 2000, a sketch of a possible witness was released by the police. The Caucasian man was seen leaving Dykstra Hall at 4.35am the night of Michael's disappearance. At the time, the man was around 35 years of age, of a heavy build and no taller than 5 foot 8 inches. He was wearing a shiny grey jacket that had a turquoise colour design on it. It is not clear if the man is somehow linked to Michael's disappearance or if he saw anything that night. To this day the man remains unidentified but the police would like to question him. Michael's family have offered a $100,000 reward. They say that there is nothing in Michael's past that might have acted as a catalyst for his disappearance. His case has been featured on television regularly, including on the shows Extra, The Montel Williams Show, National Enquirer TV and MSNBC's Missing Persons. It was on The Montel Williams Show that Sylvia Brown, a self-proclaimed psychic, appeared in order to speak about Michael's case. She reported having a vision about Michael that led her to believe he was alive and living near UCLA. She also mentioned the towns of Brentwood and Westwood. There is, however, no proof to her claims and Michael's mother has stated that she does not believe in what Sylvia said. Although an unreliable source, a Reddit user who had graduated from UCLA in 1999 said that many students felt that Michael's disappearance had something to do with someone he had met online. Then, in 2013, one of Michael's younger brothers wrote a blog post that suggested that Michael had been involved in drugs. According to the younger brother, Michael's friends confirmed to his family that he had been into raving and ecstasy. His friends thought that this had something to do with the disappearance. The younger brother believes that Michael was high or drunk when he vanished and that he met with foul play. Minutes have turned into hours, hours into days, days into months and months into years for the family of Michael. They spend every day bracing themselves for the worst news possible. Michael's disappearance is being investigated as a homicide.